not when he was killed, but when Zimmerman was not indicted. Right. So that was, I remember because I was out on tour with my band in Europe, and we got that news on a Sunday before getting on a plane or a train or something. And we, it was like getting that news when you're abroad as Americans, kind of representing what it means to be American or representing Americanness abroad. And then it's sort of like, who are we? What does it mean that it's not illegal to hunt and kill children? Like, what is in this country? Like, so um, that really shook us, you know? And, um, and that was around that time when they had asked me to write some music for the band, and for that band, for the, the elders, for Reggie yeah. Wickman, Andrew Surreal, and Oliver Lake, yeah. 303, they're called. So, so, uh, so I just didn't know what else to do, except somehow speak to that. Um, and they were up for it, because they, you know, like Reggie Wickman, so now in his late 70s, or he might even be 80 by now. But, um, you know, these are guys who knew oppression. Like, yeah. they knew segregation. They knew what that felt like. They yeah. faced it themselves. And um, so they knew what was up, you know? And so yeah. it was kind of like to connect that do those dots. Like, right. okay, this, is a, this isn't just a problem of today. It's mm -hmm. kind of like it's something that spans generations and that... Uh, actually is a kind of one of the underlying um, oppositional forces that this music was born in the face of, you know? Yeah. It's, but so, you named it uh, Sweet for Trayvon, Tamir Rice, and others. I well, thought. it's called Sweet for Trayvon and Thousands More. That's right. the name of it. Yeah. And it was from back then in 2013. And, and uh, I wish it were not relevant anymore, but yeah. it still is. And, and even just to connect that... I don't know, I guess I've been thinking about this, like, um, there's an ethos of cruelty and of hatred and of, um, I don't know, like, that just sort of runs through the fabric of this place. Yeah. That, um, you know, we all grew up with it, those of us who grew up here, and, uh, but kind of seeing it come to the fore again, it's sort of like, oh, this is really the American problem. You know, like the yeah. American story of the American problem and like all these conversations that are happening today about reparations and stuff, it's like, well, yeah, like somehow we need to face this, this fact that the, this place was stitched together out of cruelty and violence and genocide and torture and, you know, child trafficking and all these things, you know. So so what does it mean for us to say we're American on the, on the backs of all of that? Yeah. Are you uh, considering reparations as their next uh, subject for music? <laughs> I mean... Um, I guess what's amazing about this area of music that I've found myself in, that I've been, you know, privileged to be a part of, is that it's something that forces you to rethink what it is to be a person. Because that's basically what the imperative was for black music in the first place. It's like, okay, you know, you're playing for people who don't think you're people. Hmm. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. What do you do then? Like, how do you get past that, or how do you re how do you shake them out of it, even temporarily? That's very tough for you, isn't it? Um, well, for me, I mean, walking into this as the child of immigrants uh, who came here in the '60s, got a very different story and a different history. Right. Um, I mean, they were descended from colonized people, but right. not from enslaved people. Right. You know, so that's a very different predicament, I guess I would say, and, and to, um, so to come to terms with both that difference and that heritage, you know, that shared heritage, yeah. and uh, think about how I might... But you say you play for people who don't really think of you in the... the well, group. what I'm saying is that's the history, you yeah. know, like that's, the, that's like when, when Billie Holiday sang Strange Fruit, mm -hmm. you know, 
Oh, okay. Which is that, and who was she singing it for? Right. You know, people at Cafe Society or when she would tour in the South, you know. So people who wouldn't necessarily let her in the front door, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily share a meal with her or, yeah, you know. No. So, so that's the kind of thing, like, that's the real tradition here. It's right. like a tradition of facing the unfaceful or like speaking to the unspeakable. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And even to walk out the door and say, I'm going to play music for a room full of strangers. Yeah. I have to commit to a belief mm -hmm. that music will do something else right. that words can't even do. What was it like, like tonight? Yeah. It was good. It was like... Here uh, in Baltimore? It was, um, <laughs> it was work. I'll put it that way. It, yeah. it didn't just... Um, it wasn't... Because you you had a sense of the air here in Baltimore. For sure. And, you know, like on the way here, I saw um, there's a billboard that someone has written, uh, you know, who, what was it called? What did it say? It said, who, whoever died from a rough ride, you know, mm. which is like, yep. like why, <laughs> right? Right. And then it says under that, the whole damn system is still full of lies, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's the air here, right? And we have, you know, Baltimore is kind of the storied place and everyone has seen The Wire and stuff like that, yeah. but there's like much more under the surface even and to know that that's uh, kind, of, kind of the fabric here and even that um, when you have these like arts institutions here that have, that are, that are well healed in the face of an oppressive city, like a city, a, a metropole that has um, its own kind of, you know, its own divisions and its own separations and its own sort of power dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have this concentration of wealth in one building, mm. then you know that it's, um, there's something nefarious beneath it right and so everyone kind of like 
the beer is it? Like they walk in here and they say, okay, we'll work with this today. Mm -hmm. You know, but then there's an understanding. I even, I kind of felt it even, I was in the, I had dinner in the restaurant here earlier. I was like, oh, yeah, this is, uh, it's not an easy place to just be, is it? <laughs> you know? yeah, it's not. <laughs> Let the record show that he's shaking his head. <laughs> Showing I can, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I guess um, as an American musician, uh, and someone who travels around the world too, like uh, you know, I guess you get more tuned into these things. Yeah. Well, how are your hands? Uh, what do They're you do to keep are... the, keep your hands uh, so nimble? You know, the hands are like the only the. It's kind of like uh, your eyelids. <laughs> you know, like a lot is happening in your head that makes your eyes move, but you don't think about like moving your eyes, you know? And so it's sort of like the hands are the end of a long chain of, um, of uh, connections and uh, relations. So, so the hand, so to me, it's kind of like this is the surface of, a, of something much um, more. Um, Right, and, and, deep, and deep and hidden. Right. As people use different parts of their bodies for different things, they have to care of them. And I watch you with the speed, and sometimes I think that you're playing the drums on the piano. Is that a correct interpretation? Well, that's a tradition, too. <laughs> part of the tradition, like the certain tradition of piano playing, like Duke Ellington and Thelonious Monk and Randy Weston and McCoy Tyner and Cecil Taylor and Sun Ra. And Jerry Allen, um, where it's sort of like there's a percussive quality that you mm -hmm. elicit, you know. Yes. Big part of it. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir.